Well, good morning, church. Danielle, Mark, and I are delighted to be here this morning with you. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Mark, before we, uh, we begin the lesson, will you invoke God's blessings on this morning's study? For sure. Thank you, Victor. Dear Lord, you know, we are, thank you so much for the blessings you've given us in this time that we can come and break away from the week on this Sabbath, this glorious Sabbath, and learn about your lesson here, a lesson of a great servant, Moses at the end of his life. And we're going to dig in today and learn about the details of that. Uh, we ask that you be with each of us as we learn about this, as we internalize it, that we get your real true message for us, each of Amen. us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Mark. Amen. Well, our, uh, this week's Sabbath School lesson is, of course, the last lesson of the quarter, lesson number 13. And of course, it deals with the resurrection of Moses, the resurrection of Moses, which of course is found in chapter 34, the very last chapter of Deuteronomy. The memory text this morning is found in Jude verse 9. Jude is a chapter, so Jude verse 9, and it says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, I'm not going to make a, any commentary about that. We've got a day dedicated to, to that, to the resurrection of Moses, so I'm going to leave it there, and I know that Danielle will talk a little bit about that as well. Now, as a brief overview uh, to this week's Sabbath School lesson, um, I want to emphasize the following. During the last 12 weeks, we have studied and learned that Deuteronomy is about God and His love, His love for the people of Israel, His love for the chosen people, for His remnant, for you and for me. This incredible love is expressed through Deuteronomy and particularly throughout the themes we've studied. Themes like the everlasting covenant, law and grace, what it means to love God and our neighbor, and perhaps more important of all, our Deuteronomy reveals to us the love of God which was most powerfully made manifest in the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. As we have seen all quarter, Moses, outside of God, is the central human being, the central figure in Deuteronomy. His life, his character, his messages are found throughout the book. Uh, God often used Moses to reveal his will, his love, and to speak to his people uh, in uh, is, is people Israel. Now as we come to the end of the quarter, the end of our study of uh, Deuteronomy, we also come to the end of Moses' life, at least his life here on earth. The beginning of the last chapter of Deuteronomy echoes the beginning of the introduction of, of, of the book of Deuteronomy. Both passages place Moses in the plains of Moab, just across the River Jordan from Jericho. So, in the first chapter of Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verses 5, we read, chapter 1, verses 5, we read, On this side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab, begun to explain this law. Moses began to explain this law. You know, Numbers, chapters 36, verses 13, confirms just that. Numbers 36, 13. It says, these are the commandments and the judgments which the Lord commanded uh, the children of Israel by the hand of Moses in the plains of Moab, by the Jordan, across to Jericho. And now, in the last chapter of Deuteronomy, just before the possession of the promised land, we read in chapter 34, verses 1, Deuteronomy 34, 1, then Moses 
went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. See, these two chapters, chapter 1 and chapter 34, um, and these two verses we've read, mark the limits, mark the beginning and the end of the book of Deuteronomy. During this period, Moses and the Israelites are encamp en encamped at Shittim across the Jordan River from Jericho. While encamped there, Moses delivered a series of public speeches and discourses outlining God's, God's providences over the last 40 years, pointing out lessons from these experiences, repeating the laws that God had revealed for the people, uh, for, for the Israelites, and for us. During the encampment, Moses ordained Joshua as his successor, and shortly before his death, he took Joshua to be to the tabernacle to receive his instruction, his charge from the Lord, at the Lord's direction. We now see Moses going up from the plains of Moab to, the Mount, to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, where he has a vision of the whole country, the promised land. As Moses was climbing Mount Nebo, he was fully aware that he would not return to the camp. God's instructions are found in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 48 to 52. 32, 48 to 52. Then the Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, verse 49, Go up this mountain of, of uh, the Aborin, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, across from Jericho. View the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel as a possession and die on the mountain which you ascend and be gathered to your people just as Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. Because you transgressed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of, of Zin, because you did not hallow me and in the midst of the children of Israel, Yet you shall see the land before you, though you shall not go there into the land which I am giving to the children of Israel. Powerful instructions. In this passage of Scripture, God made it cl quite clear to Moses that he would not be able to enter the promised land. God told him why he could not. God provided him an opportunity to view the land of Canaan and then he tells him that he will die and be buried, buried on top of the mountain. Ellen G. White explaining it in Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 470 and 471, makes this statement. Moses knew that he was to die alone. No earthly friend would be permitted to minister to him in his last hours. There was a mystery and awfulness about the scene before him, from which his heart shrunk. The severest trial was his separation from the people of his care and love, the people with whom his interest and his life had so long been united. But he had learned to trust in God, and with unquestioning faith, he committed himself and his people to his love and mercy. As Moses' life and ministry revealed uh, much about the character of God, so too does his death and his resurrection. In this week's lesson, we will focus on the resurrection of Moses, an event that is not explicitly recounted in the books of Deuteronomy, although it is suggested through a few textual, uh, textual clues. We will also explore the significance of the event of the resurrection of Moses to help us understand the resurrection of humankind, your, your potential and my potential resurrection, and give us hope in the heavenly kingdom of God uh, the, uh, and the new promise of land. We will also encounter the following themes that will make this study relevant for God's people today as present truth. Justice and grace, 
death and resurrection and the great controversy. Now, Danielle and Mark, you are both going to share and explain the sin of Moses. So, Danielle, will you, will you begin? So, part one, <laughs> before we turn it over to Mark, uh, as Victor just summarized, we are with Moses uh, at the, on the plain of, uh, uh, in front of Jericho, on the other side of the okay. river, uh, mm -hmm. and just waiting before, and he's, we've watched the entire quarter, him doing a summary for the Israelites and reminding them with fervor how God provided for them step by step and with fervor encouraging them to, to honor and obey the Lord and with fervor also underlining all the promises that go, come along with obeying and what the consequences are. He is like a father uh, anxiously guiding them before he's going, saying his parting words to his children. But as we are reading, then we've read the sad turn of events uh, that Victor had read in the opening, but we'll reread so that we can take it a little slower. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 48 to 52. Then the Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, Go up this mountain of the Eberim, Mount Nebo, which is the land of Moab, across from Jericho, View the land of Canaan, so he's told to climb up the mountain to see the land that the Israelites are going to enter, which I give to the Israel as a possession, and die on the mountain which you ascend. And you're going, oh, and be gathered to your people, just as Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor and was gathered to your people, uh, his people, because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, because you did not hallow me in the midst of the children of Israel. Yet you shall see the land before you, though you shall not go there into the land which I am giving to the children of Israel. So the Lord is basically saying, I'm going to let you enter, uh, see it from above. I'm giving you this present, but you're not going to enter because you sinned. Is this the first time that Moses is hearing about this? No. Actually, as we are reading together the original event of what happened of Meribah Kadesh, we see that the Lord told him immediately at that time that this was going to be the result. So Moses has been preparing. That's really why he's taking the time with the Israelites. He already knows that he's not going to enter the land. Um, and that's why he's preparing them. So let's read now the ev original event. But before we read... In Numbers chapter 20, verses 5 to 12, let's kind of think for a minute what's happened. First of all, uh, right before Miriam, Moses and Aaron's sister, had passed away. So we can kind of imagine maybe a little bit of their mind frame. I mean, they're not, they already have traveled, they have contended with the Israelites, complaining all the way, but now also their beloved sister, companion for all these 40 plus, no, 80, 90, 80 years ha has passed away. Mm. And, you know, they're in that mind frame. So here it goes, Numbers 20, 5 to 12. And why have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? So what's happening? They're thirsty, they don't have water, and they're starting to do their normal behavior, complaining, complaining, and uh, woe me, and why should we? And it's continuing. It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. That should be very encouraging. <laughs> then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. So far, so good. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, your rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? So first of all, he's really chiding them. Now, the Lord hasn't chided them. 
but he's taken that liberty. I can't blame him though, <laughs> I, I, I might do the same. But then he says, and this is where the fault starts really and truly, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Right. And I want to underline the word we, he didn't say I, yeah. he said we. Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then immediately, verse 12, then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. So this was when it happened, how it happened, and the decision of the Lord at that time immediate. Now why did the Lord make such a strict and immediate and humiliating decision upon Moses and Aaron? Um, first, the Lord had water gushing out of the rock, so the re immediate response from the Lord was he provided, despite their shortcoming. I mean, the Lord could have said, no, I'm not going to give you any water. <laughs> yeah. It's like punishment for all. But no, the Lord provided. In his love and generosity, he provided. But what does the rock represent? What did he struck? As we know, and we have studied, the rock represents the Lord. And did Moses and Aaron know who the rock represented. Let's see together Deuteronomy 32, 3, 4 and see Moses' very words in Deuteronomy. And here it is. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without justice, righteous and upright is he. They knew clearly that the rock was a representation of the Lord, and they were speaking. I mean, the fact that he was going to speak to the rock, the Lord told them to speak to the rock, and the rock would yield, is exactly what we're to do when we reach to the Lord. We are going to the Lord, we speak to the Lord, and the Lord provides from us, and he, it's likewise for, for them. Instead, he struck the rock, representing the Lord. So we can kind of see the magnitude uh, here. But we also see the love of generosity and grace that God provided still for them in that right. moment Amen. of disobedience. Right. Amen. And the other thing is, uh, when we're looking at this, we, we see the word we, must we. With the immediate, swift and immediate discipline that the Israelites could see that God is no respecter of person. Persons And, you know, Moses and Aaron were privileged from their perspective. They were the leaders. They were the ones that were, uh, Moses in particular, the one that could, got to see the Lord face to face. The only one that got to see the Lord face to face. So you could tell that maybe they would think he would surely be saved. But the Lord wanted to show them uh, that he was no respecter of person, that obeying is the only way for all. Um, and th that he's fair. He, he did not look um, from the human perspective. He only looked at the internal. Now, the other thing is, what about Aaron? Did Aaron say a word? Did he struck anything? Mm -hmm. No. So from our point. human perspective, we can really say, yeah. wait a minute, that's unfair. But we also are told that the Lord judges the heart. And Aaron must have been in the same heart. The Lord judged his heart along with Moses. They were in the same mind frame. And that's why. And that when, when Moses really said, must we bring, he was talking for himself and Aaron. Now, how important is this to us? Uh, we could say Moses and Aaron were the chosen priests of God, but just like the Israelites, it's important to us. We could say we are different, but we have a couple texts that tell us that we are priests, just like they are part of a royal priesthood, we are as well. So First Peter chapter 2, verses nine, verse 9, but you are, this is a New Testament to, the new, to us as believers speaking, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, mm. that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then Revelation 1, 5 to 6, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. 
to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. So we are just as responsible to our fellow men and wherever we go, representing Christ just as Moses and Aaron were to the Israelites. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Mark, um, paint the picture. Now continue on. Daniel, yeah. excellent points on the first section of Moses, you know, the sin of Moses. And, you know, and I wanted to say that obviously I mean, when I read that, you know, you know we, we can clearly see how Moses wanted to take matters into his own hand and kind of act like a god. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right? We, exactly. Right? But I'm going to point out, and I, in addition to that, and I think one of the things that I think G God points out to us through the scriptures, and I'm going to say that, is that one of the faults of this situation is that he corrupted God's nature to others. Amen. Um, it really in a critical time. And let's dig a little Amen. bit further in that. And I want to go into the, to the, to the, to the text and see where we can, we can see that um, as pretty evident, at least to me. Um, we're going to start with, um, once again, reading through numbers. Uh, we're going to go and talk about specifically why, what God says to Moses right after he strikes the rocks. So we're going to go Numbers 20, verses 12 and 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me, to hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, mm -hmm. therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land in which I have given them. Right. And then he says, this is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hallowed among them. Right. So really, God reiterate that. God said, you didn't believe me, and you didn't hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Why is this so important? Because Moses had a special place with the Israelites. Right. He was. He was. And we know this all the way back at the burning right. bush. And we'll read the burning bush just to remind us about this. He had a very special place of leadership, of spiritual leadership. Right. In Exodus verses 3, verses 2 through 4, it talks about this. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of the fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked and beheld, behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will not turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. Right. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, the God, the God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And then we're going to skip down. There's more to that on the burning bush, but let's skip down to the end of it. Chapter 3, verses 13 and 15. And this is what God says for Moses to do um, with regards to the children of Israel. Then, then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And we've heard, read this earlier in a, in a previous uh, uh, lesson. It says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you should tell the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you, has sent Moses to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord your God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me, being Moses, to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. God was sent by, Moses was sent by God to the children of Israel. So while he cannot be God, and obviously he cannot be God, he has a very special position of a spiritual leader. He Amen. represents God's nature. Amen. When he is angry and strikes the rock, mm. the children of Israel would th may think that God is angry and striking right. the rock. That is right. And I think, to me, that's, a, that's the point when God says, hollow me in the eyes of of the children of Israel. I think that's what he's Amen. trying to say. Exactly. Mm. This is a serious, serious nature. Exactly. And it's a serious nature for all of us. I mean, in addition to that, I think, I think also God saw jo J Moses and he, he didn't really believe that he could just speak to the rock and the water would come out. He, he, he needed to do something, take it into his own hands, right? right. And strike it, do right. some action. Right. It's kind of sobering, you know. Um, how many times have we not believe that God would provide for us, right. that God says He's going to provide for us. Well, what if our food, our shelter, our finances? You know, so I think that the thing that, that Moses did is something that, that is, is a little sobering, that it's something that I could easily do. Exactly. How many times have we gotten angry with others exactly. for, being, for not doing the right thing? Exactly. God does not want that from us. He wants us to hallow His name to others. Amen. 
to show his true nature of a loving, caring, and nurturing God. The other one I think I point out, this is a, a little bit, I read into this, it's a pretty precarious time for the Israelites. Um, and, and, you, know, you, t- you mentioned about it, they're, they're camped across the, the river Jordan from Jericho. Jericho. And what has Moses been telling them that they're going to do? Exactly. They're going go, to they're gonna go to Jericho. Exactly. But there's a lot of people in Jericho and exactly. the Promised Land. There's Canaanites, there's Hittites, there's Amorites. Exactly. I, I, I like saying all these names. The Hivites, the Jebusites. I mean, there's a lot exactly. there. So I don't know how many times Moses speaks to the children of Israel. I think, in my mind, I think the children of Israel are scared. And, yep. mm-hmm. and I don't know about you, but when I'm frightened and when I'm, th- I'm, I'm stressed out, I tend to complain. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> and I tend to complain about kind of unreasonable right. things. Right. Here are the children of Israel, and you mentioned it, Daniel. I mean, they're complaining again about leaving Egypt, which was how many years ago? Yeah. Uh, 40 years ago? 40 40 years. (laughs) But I think that they were doing it because they were scared. Right. Numbers 20, verses 5 says, and and, and what this, Daniel mentioned this, and I'll say it again. And why have, we, have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of gra- grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So this is in, in, in stuff. But God set it up. So they, and I think they were scared. And God set up this miracle with Moses when he came to him that he needed water to really help the children of Israel other than giving them water. And um, think about this in Numbers 20, verses 8. And let's think about how God, this miracle that he would have done in verses 20, verse 8, and what he told Moses to do. Take the rod, you and your brother, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before your eyes, and he will yield water. Thus you shall bring water out for them of the rock and give, and give drink to the congregation and the animals. What a wonderful miracle it would have been. <laughs> Uh, he has us just say, just water's coming out. Uh, God said his water's coming out and the water would pop out. If I was scared and frightened and seeing this great miracle that God's going to do to mm-hmm. me, I think it would encourage me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what God wanted there for mm-hmm. there. Instead, what, is that? what did he do? Moses and, and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and said to, he, and said to them, Here now, you rebels, <laughs> you must bring out the water. And he struck the rock twice completely different picture. The end result right. was they got, their, they got their water, but it didn't help them in, uh, in their nourishment. And I think what truly God did, and I think that's why it's so important, and that's why as leaders, you know, as people that learn about the Lord, m- ensuring that we tell people about it, but we, we don't twist the nature of God's, God's nature and when we talk to others. And I think that was what he wanted to do. I'm going to finish this up in Patriarchs and Prophets and talking about um, from uh, Ellen White and what she talked about uh, Moses and, and really kind of, you know, what's the, what was the reason for, one of the reasons for, um, you know, this harsh, this it may be harsh, but maybe appropriate punishment for Moses. Never till exemplified um, in the sacrifice of Christ were the justice and the love of God more strikingly displayed than in his dealings with Moses. God shut Moses out of Canaan to teach a lesson that should, have, that should never be forgotten. God requires exact obedience, and we are never to take the glory which is due to their maker. He could not grant the prayer of Moses that he might share in the inheritance of Israel, but, but he did not forget or forsake his servant. And we're going to learn further about what he did next. I mean, uh, Amen. thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Mark. He really misrepresented Christ's character at that particular time. Mm-hmm. So he, 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 he disobeyed, he was not faithful, and he represented God's character. And so yeah. we need to remember uh, that particular. So let's talk about the death of Moses. In all the Bible, God is represented not only a, as a tender father, but as a righteous judge, even though, as we read in Exodus chapter 34, verses 7, God delights in showing mercy and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet, in that verse it says, by no means he will clear the guilty. Moses, having come so far, having gone through so much, was not allowed to lead the congregation of Israel into the promised land. 
Was he going to be left out of the fulfillment of the promise God made to Abraham many centuries earlier, as we read in Genesis 12, 7? As God says to your descendants, I will give this land. Well, so what happened to Moses? I really have two questions that I'm going to address in, in this particular section. What happened to Moses? And so what did the Lord say about Moses that showed how special Moses was? But what happened to Moses? In Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 to 7, 34, 1 to 7, we read, Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, which is the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross, cross over there. Verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Verse 6. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Behor. But no one knows his grave to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. Notice that in Deuteronomy 34.4, the Lord said, said that, I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. There is just no way that Moses, standing where he was, could have seen with normal vision all that the Lord had pointed him from Moab to Dan to Naphtali and so forth. Just no way. You see, Ellen G. White in chapter 43, and I really would write, like to recommend that you read it, chapter 43 of Patriarchs and Prophets, makes it clear that this was a supernatural revelation, not only of the land, but also of what it would look like after they had taken possession of the land. In Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 472 and 473, Ellen White writes, And now a panoramic view of the land of, of promise was presented to him. And we're talking about Moses. Every part of the country was spread out before him, not faint and uncertain in the dim distance, but standing out clear, distinct, and beautiful to his delighted vision. She goes on to say, in this scene, it was presented not as it then appeared, but as it would become with God's blessing upon it in the possession of Israel. He seemed to be looking up, um, looking upon a second Eden. There were mountains clothed with cedars of Lebanon, hills gray with olives and fra fragrant with the odor of vine. Wide green plains, bright and flowers and rich in fruitfulness. Here the palm trees of the topics. There waving fields of wheat and barley. Sunny valleys musical with the ripple of brooks and the song of birds. Goodly cities and fair gardens. Lakes rich in the abundance of the seas. Grazing flocks upon the hillside and even amid the rocks the Wild, uh, the wild bees hoarded treasure. And then she says, It was indeed such a land as Moses inspired by the Spirit of God that described to Israel. Moses saw the chosen people established in Canaan, each of the tribes in its own possession. So Moses saw the promised land just as God had told him he would. So what did the Lord say about Moses? that showed what a special man he was. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5, Moses is called the servant of the Lord. In Joshua chapter 1, the Lord is speaking to Joshua and telling him in Joshua chapter 1, verses 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. And then in Joshua 
in, in verses 7, God tells Joshua, Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. You know, the Apostle Paul in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 5, makes this observation. And Moses indeed was faithful in all, uh, in all God's house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. You know, the word translated servant in the book of Hebrews is therapon. That is where the English word therapy derives from. The term denotes sympathetic and faithful ministry. The untiring and loving and tender concern of Moses for his people is placed on record to his credit and to the glory of God. Moses, the servant of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 10, it reads, But since then, since Moses, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Mm -hmm. Face to face is a figure of speech to describe intimate association, an intimacy, a friendship shared. No other human being ever had a closer association with Jehovah. Moses had a fellowship with God that greatly developed and strengthened his character. Consequently, he has influenced history throughout all succeeding time since his presence. What an incredible story. The Lord was showing Moses that despite everything, despite his sin, as Daniel and Mark spoke about, even despite his mistakes, God was going to be faithful to the covenant promises that he had made with the fathers of Israel and with him himself. And as we will see on Wednesday, on Wednesday's lesson, the Lord had something even better in store for his faithful servant, yet flawed servant, Moses. Danielle, talk about the resurrection of Moses. Wednesday. <laughs> so the resurrection, it's the exciting part of our lesson today. <laughs> um, the text in Deuteronomy that we reviewed and reviewed very carefully does not mention the resurrection of Moses per se. It refers specifically to his death, but states nothing about his resurrection. But there are a number of clues from the biblical text, however, that point to the idea of resurrection. The most significant of a hint of the resurrection of Moses is found in the strange ending statement of Deuteronomy uh, chapter 34, verses 4 through 6, the very end of it, but we'll review the entire section. So let's review it together. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verses 4 to 6. Then the Lord said to him, to whom? To Moses. This is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So Moses, a servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley, in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his grave to this day. This ending part of the verse, no one, but no one knows his grave to this day, um, and the very fact that God is mentioned as the only one involved in Moses's, in the bur 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 burial of Moses, indicates that there was something very special about the burial of Moses. Uh, also, the phrase, the Hebrew phrase of al pi Yahweh, which is according to the word of the Lord. This is in verse, um, in the verses that we've just read. According to the word of the Lord. Pe, the mouth. It's like the word or the mouth of the Lord. As the means, and pe is also the means of blowing, sort of similar to giving uh, life. Whether literal or figurative speech, it can be used both ways. And it's strangely evoking God's breathing the breath of life uh, in Genesis, 
chapter 2-7. So let's review Genesis 2-7 because it's similar language. And the Lord God for men of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life and men became a living being. Okay, right. Daniel, but that's giving life. But it's creation. But there's a similarity to death as well. In Ecclesiastes, talks about death. Right. In Ecclesiastes mm -hmm. chapter 12, right. verse 7. So I'm hoping to have that on the screen. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. It says, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. And it's similar language. So the breath being, being given at creation and then the breath going back to God at death. It's similarly. So Moses, we also know that Moses was very special to God and the Deuteronomy text tells us so in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10. So Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10 says, But since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Right. So even more than that, there is the information about the perfect health of Moses in, when he died, suggesting the abnormality of his death. So we're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7. So Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7 says, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. He was in perfect health. I mean, he, he is mm. 120 by now, and he is mm, I hope I can do that. vibrant. <laughs> vibrant. So it, God has preserved him. He was in perfect health. So did he die of natural causes? Um, Adding to the Deuteronomy text is God proclaimed power to kill and to give life again. We'd like to look at that. So let's read it together. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, it says, Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. So let's kind of summarize this analysis that we've done. So let's summarize. God being the only present at Moses' death, God was the only one there, no one being able to find Moses' grave, the information about the perfect health of Moses when he died, point, pointing to the abnormality of his death, Moses did not die of natural causes. causes. God put him to death himself on the mouth of the Lord, as we read in the text 34, uh, 4 to 6. Mm and then raised him from his death. Moses was not allowed to enter the earthly promised land, but he entered the heavenly promised land, a heritage that awaits God's people at the time of their future resurrection, as Thessalonians 4, 13, 18. We will have Amen. to wait for the Lord's return mm -hmm. to be resurrected. Moses was resurrected sooner. Now that's all good, Danielle, but why do you state that God resurrected Moses? There are a couple of key texts in the New Testament that support that, that gives us this indication. Mm -hmm. The book of Jude, mm -hmm. which is the penultimate book of the Bible, is the book right before Revelation, Revelation. so it's in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only one book, so we're only looking at verse Jude, the only chapter of Jude, verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dare not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So we see here that there is a contention between Christ or Michael the archangel also. We know that Michael the archangel rep is representing Christ and is Christ. Contending with the devil for Moses' body. Okay. We wonder, well, is that literal or what is it? But we have visions of Job, the story of Job, when the devil also was basically contending ownership of this earth to the Lord. And when he was saying, uh, and the Lord said, don't you see my Job, my, my servant Job, who's faithful to me? And he says, oh, yes, he's faithful to you, but let me touch him. So it's similar to that situation. There is obviously contention between God and the devil for us. But the second indicator of Moses' resurrection was the fact that Moses appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. So that was before, just days before Jesus being crucified 
when he went up to pray. And we're looking at that in Matthew 17, verses 1 through 5. So, now after, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face, so Jesus' face, shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Now, we know already about Elijah, that Elijah never died. We, we, read from the we know from the text that he was taken up directly to heaven. Uh, the text tells us so. We've studied that in past lessons. Uh, and we can look it up if, if you'd like to. You can look it up if you'd like to look that up. But Moses, we, this is our indication that he as well has been resurrected. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. From this text, it can be concluded that the Lord triumphed in the contest over Moses' body that we read in Jude and raised him from his grave, making him the first known subject of Christ's resurrective power. But how could Christ do that for a sinner? Moses, someone who had violated the law, the answer, of course, could only be the cross. It is the same answer for each one of us. It's just that for Moses, it was sooner. Thanks so much, Danielle. How wonderful it is um, to know that Moses dies. He has an opportunity to see uh, the promised land in its fullness, in its radiance. He actually saw more. Read that chapter, chapter 43. And then the Lord comes calls him and he's resurrected mm -hmm. and the two of them rise to the new jerusalem mm -hmm. isn't that amazing mm -hmm. now what does that mean to us yeah so a couple good things and i'll dig into today but i wanted to start out with a kind of a concept that ellen white presents in patriarchs and prophets when about talking about the death of moses where she said that you know moses and i'm paraphrasing here right moses was a type of a christ prototype right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, mm -hmm. for the Israelites, you know, mm -hmm. he led a life of suffering and turmoil mm -hmm. and sacrifice so that the Israelites mm -hmm. could go to this earthly Canaan. Amen. And that's what she, that's what she says there. Mm -hmm. You know, and for me, the fact that, that we've learned you know, he's died, but then we know that he has been resurrected just makes that kind of any more mm -hmm. close parallel. Of course, he's not the Christ, but it's a Christ prototype Amen. before mm -hmm. Christ. And, and when he gets resurrected as Danielle and, and Victor said, you know, he's not going to that, heaven, that, earthly, that earthly Canaan. He's going to the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. And let's read in Hebrews 12, verses 22, that talks, uh, talks about this fact. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, into an innumerable company of angels. You know, and as, we, as uh, Daniel pointed out, uh, Moses was actually not the first one to go to heaven in the Bible. There were others. Um, exactly. He's probably the third one, if, I'm count, if I do my counting correctly. <laughs> okay. right. and, yeah, but he's the first one to be resurrected. Um, the, first one, the first one to go to heaven was actually Enoch, yeah. all the way back in mm -hmm. Genesis. Mm -hmm. And let's read Genesis 5, verses 24. And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. And I think the not means he wasn't going to die. He was, exactly. was going to take him. And so he that was, was no more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, maybe that's, that's right. Exactly. And was not. Uh, I'm here or not? Yep. Okay, that was it. And then, of course, Elijah. We've Elijah. learned about Elijah. Mm -hmm. uh, two Kings, uh, two Kings, two and eleven. If we put that up, I'll, I'll do that. Then, then it happened as they continued and, and talked, and suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to a whirlwind into heaven. So Amen. Moses was the third to go into heaven, but the first to be resurrected. And I think right. the point of, th of this lesson is, is that actually just like Moses, we're each going to be resurrected. That's right. Um, and there's a couple choices about that resurrection that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, when we die, we're going to fall asleep. Um, and that's the term. We're going to die. We're going to be, we're not going to be around. But we will be resurrected at the end. And there's two options for us as we dig into this. One, of course, is we'll be resurrected at the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
the other one is the final judgment. And I want to talk about, let's dig about that resurrection that talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's do that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the triumph of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Amen. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. So in, the, in this phrase when he says the dead in Christ, that's the people that are asleep that have and that before they died, they had, they had chosen Jesus as their Savior. They knew him. They'd had that personal relationship with him. When he comes, they will be risen up and to join with him. Amen. There is another option, and I'll mention it. I think it is. There's another option here, and that's the final judgment that happens a thousand years after the second coming of Correct. Jesus. Revelation 20, verses 5 talks about this. But the rest of the dead, the, the, the dead that didn't have Christ, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And those are the people that didn't have Christ in them That's when they correct. died. Okay? And, and I want to talk about, just, just we'll kind of dig into to, to Revelations uh, and, and talk and show what kind of happens at this, this, final, this final judgment here. Um, and uh, just to, to give us some some context here. In this, I'm going to go to Revelations 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him sat, who sat on it, and whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And then I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. And the sea came up, gave up their, the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each according to his works. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And so the, the idea is that what I, the important part here is that, that we all, as we leave this earth, are going to die, but we'll have the second resurrection just like Moses. And what I want to end this, this phrase here is that there's a choice that we have. Is it going to be, the, is it going to be with Jesus Christ or is it going to be right. with um, the final judgment? And I want to show, uh, uh, we're going to dig into Paul here in 1 Corinthians, and I want you guys to read about the great hope, the, the, the hope that we have and knowledge that have that that we will be with Christ. And this is what, what Paul does, but Paul does it in a slightly different way in 1 Corinthians. He, he takes the negative. He takes the opposite right. of this one. Right. And so what happens if Christ didn't rise? What happens there? And that's a question that he answers here, okay? And let's, let's read this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 13 through 22. But if there was no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if, the, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is empty. Amen. Yes, we are found false witness of God because we have testified of God and, he has, and that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up and in fact the dead did not arise. For if the dead did not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If this life only we have the hope in Christ, we of all men are the most pitiable. But that, but then he turns it around. That's kind of, you know, he does this counter here. He turns it around, and in verse 20 he says, But now Christ, we know, has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. Amen. Two things I want to say this. First of all, Christ is our passage forward. Yes. That's our first forward. The other one I say is that the, when he talks about in 13 and 18, it, to me, it would be for those people that, it would be the same of those people that today don't know about Jesus Christ. Right. How horrible a, a thought that could be. And I pray for them every day that we can impart our message to them, that we can show God's true nature to them so that they can have that hope that when Jesus comes, that be, through Jesus is coming, you know, we, and through him we can be made alive. I'd like to close this day out um, by the great hope in Jesus 
Um, and Hebrews 1 through talks about Jesus who is purging all our sins. Uh, Hebrews 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. He, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the power, the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Thank Amen. you, Victor. Yeah. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you, Mark and Danielle. Danielle, do you have final words? Yes, certainly. Um, thoughts, I, first of all, I loved our, this lesson and all the points Mark brought out and you brought out, and I just love that. Thank you. Um, we are, just as Moses was representing God and as Aaron were, we are also representing God and uh, we are to give him glory. Amen. The way we allow God's glory to shine through us without taking the credit away from God is very, very important. We represent God sort of in a um, concentric ripple effect, uh, starting with those closest to us, our families, our loved ones, and on and on and on outwards to the point where sometimes we don't even realize how people uh, absorb how we represent God. Amen. But we are not to overthink it. Uh, we're just to obey his instructions implicitly, completely, without debate and without second thoughts, pulling ourselves completely out of the way and letting him direct and guide. Amen. Thanks so much, Danielle. That's very thoughtful. Mark? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a fun lesson. Um, and, um, you know, to me, I, the other thing I wanted, another point I wanted to say was that, you know, this lesson shows us that great spiritual leaders among us still make mistakes. Absolutely. You know, we heard, in fact, we've heard about this before, yep. Elijah yep. Um, mm -hmm. yep. and a last quarter's yep. lesson, you know, like Moses, Elijah failed to believe in the Lord and trust in him right after right. the Lord showed him, you know, his great power through that fire that was brought down on the sacrifice Elijah prepared at the top of the mountain. In both cases, Elijah and Moses, he, God, still had further plans for them. Absolutely. Right. You know, for Moses, the plan was to continue to prepare the children of Israel right. and to also smoothly transition that spiritual leadership to Joshua. And he, mm -hmm. and he did a great job. Amen. And, of course, we know. Um, you know, and also in Elijah, he had also things that he had to do before he went up into the chariot of fire that we heard about earlier, too. But actually, God has a plan for each of us Amen. to follow us as we Amen. follow him. It may not always, we're going to make mistakes, and we may not always get what we want. Moses didn't get what he wanted to go into Canaan. I think he Amen. did. He wanted to go there, okay? But he didn't get what he wanted. But God has promised that if we focus on him, mm -hmm. our resurrection, our salvation is guaranteed. Amen. 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 And Moses was an example for us in this, okay? Thank Amen. you, Victor. Thanks, Mark. I really hope that you've enjoyed the lesson. I want to conclude. I want to quote uh, from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 4, 479, and, uh, and perhaps just um, conclude by reminding us what a wonderful, wonderful lesson this is for you and for me, an encouraging lesson, a lesson of faith, a lesson of trust, a lesson of obedience, a lesson that asks us to really live the life that Christ wants us to live faithfully. And so Ellen G. White in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 479, tells us that through the resurrection of Moses, the resurrection was forever made certain. Mark made it clear. We all will be resurrected. The, the, the wicked will be resurrected after the millennium. The good, those that have died in Christ, will be resurrected at the second coming. We'll all be resurrected. Satan was despoiled of his prayer. The righteous dead would live again. In consequence of sin, Moses had come under the power of Satan. In his own merits, he was death's lawful captive. Why do we die? Because we're sinners. But he was raised to immortal life, Amen. holding his title in the name of the Redeemer. We are resurrected in the name of the Redeemer Amen. because the Redeemer paid your price and my price. Moses came forth from the tomb glorified and ascended with his deliverer to the city of God. And I pray that you and I 
if we die before the Lord comes, that we will be raised from the tomb, glorified, ascending with our deliverer to enjoy the promised land. You know, in Desire of Ages, pages 421 and 422, uh, Ellen White makes the following, the following statement. Um, Upon Mount Pisgah, Moses had stood gazing upon the land of promise. But because of his sin at Meribah Kadesh, it was not for him to enter there. Nor for him, not for him was the joy of leading the host of Israel into the inheritance of their fathers. His agonized entreaty, in other words, his prayer, his request, uh, I pray, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain in Jordan, was refused. The hope that for 40 years had lighted up the darkness of the desert wanderings must be denied. A wilderness grave was the goal of those years of toil and heart burden care. But he who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 3.20, had in this measure answered his servant's prayer. Moses passed under the dominion of death, but he was not to remain in the tomb. Christ himself called him forth to life. Satan the tempter had claimed the body of Moses because of his sin. But Christ the Savior brought him forth from the grave. And then, 15 centuries later, Moses upon the mountain of transfiguration was a witness to Christ's victory over sin and death. And pay attention. He represented those who shall come forth from the grave and the resurrection of the just. Amen. How profound it is for me to be able to live a life that says, God cared, and you mentioned it, about Moses, about Isaiah. And he cared about all the others that he resurrected when he was here on this earth. Amen. And so, a resurrection is, is, is assured. If we put our hope in the Lord, and if we live a life that, that God wants us to live according to His will. So I want to thank you, Mark, and I want to thank you, Danielle, Amen. for this lesson. Amen. And I'm going to ask that you bow your heads with me as we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for the book of Deuteronomy. A book of love. A book of inspiration. A gospel, Lord, that you've provided. Lord, I want to thank you today for the life that we've learned about, the life of Moses. And yes, like us, Moses was not perfect. But Lord, he lived a life with you in, embedded in his heart. And so I want to ask, oh Father, that you send us the Holy Spirit every day that you take us and mold us, that you change our characters. Lord, that you take our will and mold it into yours, that you help us die for sin. So, Father, we become bond servants of yours so that we may glorify you. And, Lord, as we glorify you, we reveal your light. We reveal your, your love and your truth. Father, we love you. But we want to love you with all our heart, with all our soul and with all our mind. And so I ask of Lord that you hold on to us, that you forgive us of our sins, and that Lord, as you did with Moses, take us through this journey to inherit the promised land in the new Jerusalem and live with you eternally. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Thank you Happy so much. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. And a wonderful Christmas. Yes, a wonderful oh, yeah. Christmas oh, yeah. to you all. Yeah.